Hi, I'm Professor Arun Sundararajan. Today we're going to be understanding what social capital is and gaining insight into the idea pioneered by Mark Granovetter of the strength of weak ties. The best place to start this discussion is by qualitatively getting a sense for what we mean when we use the phrase social capital. Many of us have different personal characteristics that determine our success. How intelligent we are, how hard you work, your ambition, your drive, your ability to work in a team, your presentation skills, different other personality traits, your ethical outlook onto life, different life experiences and how they have shaped your objectives. All of these are personal characteristics and certainly personal characteristics play a role in determining whether or not you're successful. However, in addition to these personal characteristics, there is also value created for you by the networks that you're in. This value is what we refer to as social capital. So let's look at a definition of social capital from the celebrated French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. He defines social capital as the aggregate of the actual or potential resources which are linked to possession of a durable network. And he further goes on to say that in this network are contained institutionalized relationships of mutual acquaintance or recognition. Now I want you to think about and answer an assignment about three elements of this definition. First of all, I want you to think about some resources that you might get from a network, from a network of your friends or your professional acquaintances. Second, I want you to think about why he uses the terms actual or potential resources rather than simply saying resources. And finally, I want you to think about why he uses the phrase durable network rather than simply saying network. Okay, now we have a working definition of what social capital is. Part of the purpose of this session is to link social capital to the structure of the networks that you're in and more specifically to make the point that social capital often depends on the position that you occupy in the different social and professional networks that you're in. You might ask at this point, um, why should I care about network position? Well, there's been a lot of interesting research over the last 30 years that has demonstrated quite convincingly that people who occupy a favorable network position enjoy a number of advantages. For example, people in a favorable network position are likely to find better jobs faster. They're likely to be promoted earlier. They're likely to close deals more rapidly. They're likely to receive higher performance evaluations, higher bonuses, be better contributors to teams, be better sources of what we think of as diverse information, and are more likely to be sources of innovation. Now, interestingly, people who occupy favorable positions in networks are also likely to be more successful criminals. They are also more likely to be successful at perpetrating corporate fraud. Of course, I'm not recommending that these are the objectives of your seeking a more favorable network position. But it's interesting because um, some of the ideas why network position leads to success in the legal world are also related to why they lead to success in the pursuit of illegal activities. All right, so we're at the point now where we've asserted that social capital is tied to network structure, and we've asserted also that occupying a favorable network position is associated with all these good things. One question you might be thinking about is, what is a favorable position? Another question that you might be thinking about is, why is this position favorable? And a third question that you might be thinking about is, what are the mechanisms? How do benefits accrue to someone who occupies one of these favorable positions? So in order to answer these questions, we have to understand three concepts from network theory. First, we have to understand what strong and weak ties are. Second, we have to understand what triadic closure is. And finally, we need to understand what a local bridge is. So let's look at these three ideas in succession. In a social network, some ties are stronger while others are weaker. There's really no algorithmic definition of what a strong tie or a weak tie is or some magic threshold that a friendship crosses before it transcends from being a weak tie to a strong tie. 
So to bring this idea to life, spend a moment thinking about the friendships in your life. Think about the ones that are close. Think about the ones that you have with your family, with your really close friends, with what my daughter might call her BFFs. These are your strong ties. The relationships that are strong, that are emotive, that are trusting, that are high bandwidth. Now think about the relationships that you have with a host of other people which aren't all that close. There's probably a much larger group of people who you kind of know, you meet them sometimes, you call them every now and again, you like their stuff on Facebook, but you don't have a really close relationship with them. This is your network of weak ties. There's no clear distinction between exactly what a strong tie is and exactly what a weak tie is. However, strong ties are more likely to be associated with a certain set of characteristics than weak ties are. Some of these characteristics are more frequent interaction, more emotional effect, more trust, and more information shared, a higher bandwidth of communication. So next, let's understand triadic closure. Let's take the term and sort of decompose it, triadic closure. So it means exactly what it sounds like, that if you have three nodes in a network, then certain triads of nodes are more likely to close or have edges that form a triangle than other sets of nodes. Now let's explain triadic closure more precisely using three people, A, B, and C. If A has a strong tie to B, and if A has a strong tie to C, then the idea of triadic closure simply says that it is more likely than not that B and C will have at least a weak tie. It's as simple as that. If A and B have a strong tie, and if A and C have a strong tie, then B and C are more likely to have at least a weak tie. It could be a strong tie as well, but there's likely to be some sort of friendship between B and C. Now, I want you to think about triadic closure in the following way. I want you to make a list of five different reasons why you think triadic closure happens. That is, if A is close friends with B and A is close friends with C, why is it likely that B and C are going to have some sort of friendship? I'll give you one reason to get you started. If A hangs out a lot with B, and A hangs out a lot with C, then chances are that B and C are going to meet and form some sort of relationship. So that's one reason. What I want you to write down is four more reasons why you think a triad consisting of a strong tie between A and B and a strong tie between B and C is likely to close. Okay, we've understood what strong and weak ties are, and we've understood the idea of triadic closure. Now let's take a look at what a local bridge is. A bridge in the physical world is something that connects two geographic areas that are otherwise disconnected. So a bridge in a network is pretty much the same thing. It's an edge that connects two parts of a network that would otherwise be completely disconnected. Even though bridges are really rare in real world networks, we often encounter what we call local bridges. A local bridge, broadly speaking, is an edge that connects parts of the network that would otherwise be far away from each other. Now let's put a more precise definition on that. An edge is a local bridge if the nodes at its endpoints have no friends in common. Let's illustrate this idea using an example. It's taken from page 47 of your Easley and Kleinberg textbook. So in this picture, the edge between A and B, or the edge AB, is a local bridge because A and B share no friends in common. You might want to look at the picture and try and think about whether there are any other local bridges in the picture or not. That would be a useful exercise. So as an aside, a way of measuring how distant the portions of the network connected by a local bridge are is by measuring what's called the span of the bridge. Simply put, the span of a bridge is the distance between the nodes that it connects if the edge were removed, or the length of the shortest path between the two nodes that are connected by the local bridge if the local bridge were removed. 
So if we go back to the example from page 47 of your Easley and Kleinberg textbook, the span of this local bridge is four because the length of the shortest path between A and B, if you were to remove the edge AB, would be four. An interesting thought exercise that you might want to go through is to think about what the minimum span of a local bridge can be. Based on the definition of a local bridge, how small could its span be? And also think about for a network of size n, or a network in which there are n nodes, what is the maximum span of a local bridge? All right, now let's bring these ideas together. First, let's assume that triadic closure is absolute. What I mean by this is, let's assume that if A and B are connected by a strong tie, and A and C are connected by a strong tie, then B and C always have at least a weak tie between them. Let's call this assumption strong triadic closure. Of course, this isn't true in reality, but it's an assumption we make in order to prove Ranavetta's theorem. Here's the network from our prior example in which we've labeled every edge as being either a strong tie or a weak tie. You can verify by going through the different triads that this network does not violate strong triadic closure. So Granovetter's theorem states that if a node satisfies strong triadic closure and has at least two strong ties attached to it, then any local bridge attached to it is a weak tie. That's a lot of words. So let's think about what Granovetter's theorem means. Let's look at that local bridge AB from the example that we've been discussing. Now suppose this edge AB was a strong tie. Then because of our assumption of strong triadic closure, BC would also have to be an edge, or the nodes B and C would also have to have at least a weak tie between them. But once we put an edge between B and C, we violate the definition of a local bridge. Think about this example a little, maybe go over it a couple of times, and you'll realize that Granovetter's theorem is actually quite simple. A local bridge has to be a weak tie because if it were a strong tie, then it would either have to violate the definition of a local bridge or it would have to violate strong triadic closure. That's pretty much it. Now, Granovetter's theorem is kind of cool because it means that the edges that connect distant parts of the network have two characteristics. First of all, because they connect distant parts of the network, they're more likely to be sources of novel or diverse information. They're more likely to be the channel through which you hear something from a group of people who you're not interacting with very frequently. And the second characteristic that a local bridge is likely to have is because of Granovetter's theorem, it's more likely than not to be a weak tie. What this means is that the weak ties in your network are going to be the ones through which you get unexpected or novel or diverse information. Now, Granovetter's result is important because it's the mechanism that is driving why certain network positions, in particular positions that bridge structural holes, are the ones associated with high social capital or with high power. We don't yet know what a structural hole is, but we'll get to that in our next session.